In this video, I'm going to teach you every single JavaScript touch event, how you can debug them on your computer, how you can use your actual phone to debug them, and most importantly, best practices about how to actually use these events. Let's get started now. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And today we're gonna to be talking all about touch events. And first I really briefly wanna just kind of show you the basics of doing touch events on your desktop. Then I'm gonna show you how to connect your phone to your desktop to do the debugging from your phone. And finally go over everything you need to know about touch events. Now to get started, I have some really basic code set up. Essentially, I just have one single div. That's this black section on the right hand side of my screen that's just taking up a portion of my screen. And I also have this dot class and this dot class is just going to let me draw a dot on the screen so you can see where I'm touching the device such as my phone on the actual desktop. So if we move over to our script, the way you set up a touch event is just like any other event listener. So we can say document dot add event listener. And you know, normally you would say click. Well, to do a touch event, we just want to say touch start. And this is going to be the start of a touch event. Now you can almost think of this as like mouse down, mouse move, and mouse up. That's kind of how touch start works. You have touch start, touch move, and then you have touch end, which is when you release the touch from your phone. So we can come in here with touch start. We get an event object from that. Now let's just console log that event object to kind of see what we're working with. So if we save this and I come over to the right hand side of my screen and I touch it, you're going to notice no matter what I do, nothing is being logged out to the screen. The reason for that is by default, when you're on your browser, just doing normal browsing, you can't actually trigger touch events. This is only for touch based devices. So if you want to trigger a touch event on your computer, what you need to do is you need to switch over to essentially the mobile view of your device. If you're doing Chrome, for example, that button is in the top left corner. And now when I click on the screen, you can see the touch events are being fired. And you can see down here, I have all this information about my touch event. Now let me just move my camera out of the way real quick so we can see what we're working with. There's really three main things that you want to know about this touch event. I'll zoom it in a little bit so it's easier to see. The first section that we want to target on is this touches array. And this touches array just tells you all the different places that the screen is currently being touched. Next, we have the target touches. And target touches tells us all of the touch things from this touches array that are inside of the target. So for example, we're targeting our document here. So this would just be the same. But if we were targeting just a particular thing like a button on our screen, this touches would only trigger for the actual button that has the touches on it as opposed to all the touches everywhere. So target touches are where you're touching within the element you're having the event on and touches is just every finger that is on the device. Then finally, if we scroll up a little ways, you'll see we have this thing called changed touches. And this is going to give us all of the touches that have changed since the last time this event fired. So for touch start, this gives us all of the new places that we're touching on the device. So change touch is really good if you like have one finger on the device and you add a new finger to the device, only the new finger is going to be in this changed array, while these other arrays are going to include all the touches that are currently on the device. So those are like the three key elements that you need to know about the touch event. So as you can see, we have touch start, we have touch move, and then we have touch end. So let's we'll just clear this real quick. I'm gonna copy this down and we can say touch move, and then we're gonna have touch end. And here I'm just gonna log out start, this is gonna say move, and this is gonna say end. So if I click, you can see we get start. As I move, if I'm holding down this touch, so I'm holding down my mouse, you can see we get move. And as soon as I release, you can see we get end. So it works very similar to the mouse-based events. But obviously this is for touch devices only. And in order to test what happens when you touch with one, two, three, four different fingers, you can't do that on a desktop because you only have one mouse. So in order to do that, we need to connect our phone to our computer. And doing so with Chrome is actually pretty easy. So here we have my actual phone, and this is an Android device, which is important to note because in order to get this to work, you need to have an Android device and connect it to Chrome. So if you have an iOS device, I'd recommend looking up instructions on how to connect an iOS device, and most likely you'll have to use Safari instead of Chrome for your browser. But what you want to do is go to your settings and scroll down to the very bottom. You'll see I have this option at the bottom called developer options. You won't have that though. So in order to enable this developer options, you need to click on this about phone section, scroll down to where it says software information, click on that, and then you need to scroll down until you see build number. What you wanna do is just click this build number seven separate times, and you should see a message at the bottom pop up that says like developer mode is turning on, and it'll turn on after you click on it seven times. Then you can go back, click on this developer options, and here you'll see a bunch of different options. But the most important one that we care about is if you scroll down, you'll find one called USB debugging. Make sure that that is turned on, and as long as you have that setting enabled, 
That means that when you connect your phone to your computer via USB cable, it'll actually show up as a device that you can interact with and most likely you'll have a prompt that shows up on your phone that says, hey, do you want to allow this computer to do debugging? And you just say yes and that's all you need to do. So once you've followed those steps to get your phone hooked up to your computer, the next thing you need to do is make it so you can access the website that you're running on your computer on your phone. And if you're running a local server, like a local host, for example, here we're running on our local host right now, which is this 127.0.0.1, that means this is running locally on my computer. But it also means it's available anywhere within the same internet connection. So like my router, any device that's connected to the same router as my computer can access this URL, but they need to use a slightly different URL. To get that URL, just open up a terminal and type in ipconfig. This is going to give you information about your local IP address. And this section that says IP4 address, that is your IP address. So almost always it's going to start with 192168, but this last number most likely is going to be different. So for me, all I need to do is take that and copy it. I can paste it up here and replace this 127.0.0.1. That's like the local host. And if I do that, you can see the site is still exactly the same if I zoom it back to the same zoom level. And that's because this is like the IP address of my computer. So anything that's connected to the same router can connect this IP address. So if you go to this URL on your phone, you should connect to the exact same page that you're using inside of your project. And for me, I'm hosting this using an extension on VS Code called Live Server. Let me just search for that real quick. So you can just see here, Live Server. But essentially anything that you're doing that host on localhost will work exactly the same. You just replace localhost with your local IP address and then navigate to this on your device. Now, once you navigate to that site on your mobile device, what you need to do is you need to go to a page which is chrome colon slash slash inspect slash hashtag devices. And it's going to bring you to this page. And I'm going to put that URL in the description for you. And hopefully if your phone is connected to your device using a USB and you have developer mode turned on, you'll see your phone down here. And you can see I'm running Chrome and I have these different web pages open. And you notice this one down here is the URL that we just mentioned. So all you want to do is just click this inspect button. And what that's going to do is it's going to open up a dev tools window. And this dev tools window right here has your phone on the left hand side and then has this console output on the right hand side. And I can interact. So when I click on my phone and I move, you can see we get that start, move, and then we get the end. Same thing, I can click over here and do the same thing. This left side is just a live preview of what is on my actual phone. Now, once all that is done, you essentially have your phone connected to your computer. You can see the output from the console when you click on your phone and everything is synced up. So when I make changes here, if I change this to N2, hit save, you can see all of that syncs up perfectly with my phone. Now, obviously it's hard for you to tell when I click on my phone because you can't see my phone. So we're gonna write some code that's not only going to explain everything you need to know about these touch events, but it's also going to visually represent where I'm touching on my device. Now, the way that we're going to do this is I'm just gonna show a red dot wherever my finger is at on my device. So one easy way to do that is we'll just come up here in the touch start and we wanna add a dot to the screen. So we're gonna say that we wanna come in here and we wanna get those changed touches. And that's because this is gonna be every time I put a new finger on the phone, that is going to be inside this changed touches array. And I actually need to convert this to an array because technically this is called a like touches list and it doesn't have a for each method, but I wanna loop through each one of these. So I'm gonna convert it to an array to loop through them. So now for each touch, what I wanna do is I wanna take my touch and I wanna create a dot element. So we're just gonna create an element and it's just gonna be a div. I want to give it a class and that class is just going to be that dot class and that dot class just gives it all the styling we care about. All we have left to do is put it in the correct position. So I can say that I want to get the top position and the way I can do this is I can take my touch and it's going to have essentially a bunch of X and Y positions. So I want to get the page Y and set that as pixels and on the left side I want to get the page X. And what that's going to do is it's going to position this dot in the top left exactly where my finger is. Then what I can do is I can set the ID of this to our touch.identifier. Now this is a really important part of each touch element is they have this identifier. And this identifier is a unique ID that corresponds to like which index it is in the array. So like zero, one, two, three, four. This is really useful because if I touch my phone with like five different fingers, each one is gonna have its own individual identifier. And when I remove a finger, I can use this identifier to figure out which one I removed. And since I saved that on my dot element, I can remove it later. Now, all we need to do is add this to our screen so we can say document.body.append our dot. And now when I click on my screen, you can see a red dot appears everywhere that I click. And as you can see, that's working just fine. And even if I put like three fingers down at once, you can see three red dots appears. That works really well. Now, the next step is obviously to remove those down here in our touch end. And this is gonna be pretty straightforward. 
what we can do is we can loop through those change touches again. And again, I'm gonna convert that to an array, just like that. So I'm gonna loop through each one of these. Oops, and this is gonna be a touch. And for each touch, all I wanna do is just remove it. So first I wanna get the dot. And we can do that by saying document dot get element by ID. And we can say touch dot identifier. And it's because up here we set the ID of our dot to the identifier of our touch. So when we remove our finger, it still has that same identifier. So we can use that to figure out what finger we removed and figure out which dot that corresponds to. Then I could just say dot dot remove. So now when I click and remove, you can see the dot disappears. And if I put multiple fingers and remove, you can see they all get removed. It works really well. Now, obviously, the only thing I have left to do is to implement this move section, which is pretty straightforward. It's very similar. I'm just going to copy this because we're looping through all of our touches again. And what I want to do is I just want to get our dot, which is just this exact line down here, get it by ID. And then I want to set the top and left position. So I can just copy that down again. Now, if I hold down and I move my finger around, you can see this dot follows. And when I let go, it's going to disappear. So now you can see exactly where I'm touching on my phone and you can see what's happening in every single section. The next thing that I want to work on is kind of explaining more about how these touch events work so we can figure out exactly what all the different elements of the events are. So inside of the touch start, the very first thing I want to look at is going to be that touches element, the change touches, and the target touches. And to do that, we're going to take advantage of this black section called top half. This black section that you can see that I have my fingers in, that has an ID of top half, and this white section is just the body of the actual document. What I want to do is I want to take this top half and I want to apply a touch event to it. So what we can do is we can come up here to the top and we can just get our top half, which is document.getElementById, and that's just top half. Then what I can do is I can say top half dot add event listener for touch start. And we can take that event like that. So now what we can do is we can just say console, whoops, console.log e.touches.length. This is going to tell me how many things are touching the screen. We're also going to log out some other things. So we're going to say this is going to be touches. There we go. Oops. Touches. Just copy that down. This one's going to be target touches. So we'll just call it target. And then this one right here is just going to be the current touches. Actually, it's called changed. There we go. So we have our touches, our targets, and our changed. So this one right here is going to be target touches. And this one right here is going to be changed touches. So this is going to tell me how many total touches I have on the device, how many of them are within the target, and how many of them are actually changing each time this event is called. So if I put one finger inside the black section, you'll see we have one total touch, one touch within our target, and one touch has changed. If I add a new finger, we now have two total touches on the screen, two targets, that are inside of here, and then we have one that has changed. If I just clear this out, we can start this over again. If I put one finger in the white section, obviously this event doesn't fire because I'm not touching within the top half. But now if I touch the top half, you can see we have two total touches. Only one of them is within our target, which is this black section, and one of them has changed recently. If I add another finger in here, you can see now we have three total touches, two in the black section, and one has changed. This changed array is almost always going to be one element long because it's almost impossible to put two fingers on the device at the exact same time. No matter how hard I try, you can see it still says changed one because if there's one millisecond of time between your two fingers hitting, they're obviously going to be in different events. Now, oftentimes when you're dealing with different touch related events, you have a lot of other things you need to worry about. For example, when I click on my screen with two fingers, I can actually zoom in and out my device. As you can see by these dots getting bigger by pulling them further apart, I'm zooming in and out. And a lot of times, if you're trying to implement some touch interface, you don't want people to be able to zoom in and out. Also, I can pull down from the top of my screen, and that's going to refresh my browser. Again, oftentimes when you're making touch-based gestures, you don't want to allow that. For example, if you're scrolling through Google Maps, you don't want to scroll down from the top of Google Maps and have it refresh your page. That's a bad interface. So what you can do is you can make sure you prevent your touch start. If I just come in here and I say e.prevent default, on the touch start, what that's going to do is anytime I touch within the top half of my page, which is the event listener I'm listening for, it's no longer going to propagate this event outwards. So if I try to do zoom, it's not going to zoom. If I try to refresh my page by scrolling down, it's not going to do that because I canceled my event from the start so that the browser doesn't know about the pinch to zoom and it doesn't know about the pull down to refresh because I prevented that action from happening, that default action. So if you're trying to implement swiping gestures and so on in your app, a lot of times you need to prevent the default in order to make sure that those work. 
Another important thing that preventing default does is it actually blocks events for click. So let's just come down here. I'm gonna say document, I wanna add an event listener for click. And we can just say whatever, it doesn't matter, console.log clicked. And for now, I'm going to get rid of this prevent default. Now, if I just tap on the screen quickly, you're gonna see it fires that clicked. Let's get rid of these other event listeners too. You can see it fires clicked. If I just really quickly tap, it fires a click. If I hold down and release, it doesn't actually fire that click. You can see here, hold down, release, it doesn't fire that click event. But if you just do essentially the equivalent of clicking, you can see it's firing that clicked event. But if I prevent default, now it's preventing that click event from firing. So if I press down in the top half section and I just do a single click, you can see it doesn't fire that click. But in the bottom half, you can see it's firing that click event. And that's just because I'm only preventing the default within the top half. So it's an important thing to know. If you want to prevent a click event from firing when you do touch related stuff, you can use prevent default to prevent that as well. Now, for example, let's say that we wanted to create an app that when you put two fingers inside of this top section, it's going to print something out to the screen. The way that we would do that is we would just come in here, we'd say, hey, if our target touches dot length is greater than or equal to two, that means we have at least two fingers in this top section, just console.log more than two fingers. And now if I come in and I put two fingers in the black section, you can see it says more than two fingers. If I have one in the black, one in the white, it doesn't work. If I have two in the white, one in the black, it doesn't work. I need to have two in the black. And it doesn't matter if I have one in the white and two in the black, you can see it's still printing that out on the side as the number increases when I put two fingers on there. All that matters is that you have at least two targets within that touch zone. And you can use this to create different gestures. For example, I could have like a two finger swipe to the right does something or two finger swipe to the left does something. You can really fine tune exactly how you want these gestures to work by implementing touch start, touch move and touch end. Now the final touch event I wanna talk about is one that you probably won't have to use very much, but it's important to know about. And that's the touch cancel event. Essentially, if for some reason your touch event was canceled, whether or not there was like a bad connection where the finger like the software bugged out, or maybe they like were touching on something and then they scrolled over top of something that's not on the browser, like they have a window in a window where they scroll over the other window and now the touch event no longer exists on the browser, that could cause this event to trigger. It's just important to know that having touch cancel means that touch end doesn't always fire. Sometimes this cancel event will fire instead. So a lot of times, whatever you do in your touch end, you also wanna do inside of your touch console. So we can just come in here, put that down, and now we're doing the exact same thing inside of our touch cancel, and we're doing it inside of our touch end. And that's just to make sure that it's going to work if for some reason this event does have a cancellation. And that's all there is to JavaScript touch events. If you enjoyed this video, you're gonna absolutely love my full guide on every single event you need to know in JavaScript. It's gonna be linked over here. And with that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.